Our next speaker is Dr. Pei. Dr. Pei is currently a postdoc at University of North Dakota in the Earth System Science and Policy Department. And she recently completed her PhD at NDSU in the Rain Science Program. Her dissertation work was a project that surveyed North Dakota grasslands for bee and plant communities. And she centered her work around the relationships between exotic species and bee communities. So let's welcome Dr. Pei. All right, so yeah, my name is CK Pei. I am currently a postdoc at UND Aerospace, and I recently did graduate from here, and I'll be sharing one of the papers that I did over looking at potential um, relationships between invasive grasses and bee communities on the grasslands here in North Dakota. So this is a more ecology-based paper study. It's not going to be talking about how to manage grasses or the extent of grasses or anything like that, um, but maybe it's nice to chat about bees, especially before a break comes. So um, when I, before I came up here to North Dakota, I worked in the Flint Hills region of Kansas at some really nice native prairie, um, which was really great to work there, except for it gave me kind of rose colored glasses in terms of what contemporary grasslands actually are. Um, so when I came up here to North Dakota and started looking at the grasslands here, I was kind of like floored by the amount of exotic plants that there are in the landscape. Um, and so a lot of, I centered my research on exotic plant interactions with the bee community. Um, usually the research involving uh, exotic plants and bees has to do with exotic floral resources and how those explain bee communities. And that's really important to look at because uh, bees require floral resources. They're really tightly linked to floral resources. So that's an obvious thing to look at. However, um, bees do have different needs. So they have nesting needs, um, which is not, not part of the floral community. Um, also other things, it's not in closed system, you know, every other things impact the amount and diversity of those floral resources. So I kind of want to look at uh, non-floral components of the plant community and how they affect and explain the bee community. So in terms of the non-floral com components of the plant community, I thought was most relatable to my study. First, structure, overall plant structure. Um, I knew that you know some bees require access to the soil, some bees like more standing litter around. And so structure is really important and it could filter out species. Another thing is just general plant community and plant community diversity. Now I am talking about, about like the non-floral plant community. And yes, I know grasses flower. I'm talking about the plants that are most uh, used by bees. Bees do use grasses or can use grass pollen, and, uh, but it's not a preferred resource. It's kind of like, God, I'll take it if it's there, but I'm not going to want it. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so this, this is inclusive of that grass community. And as we know, there are two species of exotic cool season grasses that are quite prevalent across North Dakota. Kentucky bluegrass and smooth brome, and those are the species that I'll be focusing on in this study. Um, and those are kind of known to, well, naturally, being them being present replaces other plant species. Um, they're also known to be really good at creating their own environment that kind of favors them, and maybe not so much the other species. And so I'd expect them to have some influence over um, things that need that plant community, like bees and pollinators. Another big thing that kind of encompasses everything is just general management. Unfortunately, my study, my data set doesn't um, address management specifically, but it does can provide some sort of ecological basis for um, informing management actions. So, um, like I said, invasive grasses have the potential to impact biodiversity, but when you're considering diverse organisms such as insect pollinators, you, it's kind of unreasonable to expect that invasive grasses or other environmental, environmental changes will affect bees all in the same way, since, there's, since bees are very diverse. So it's kind of like a filtering system. So obviously there's a lot of things that happen that make exotic grass invasions present. Um, so there's probably a lot more factors than the ones I have up there. Uh, but like I said, those exotic grass invasions could impact the plant community, decide what kind of forb species are there, um, which then will determine what bee species can be there because which are um, reliant on those plant species. So that's an indirect relationship from exotic grasses to bee species. However, there also are uh, direct, uh, I, th I think direct associations that could happen as well from exotic grasses to bees. Um, and it's kind of through that structure. So under certain circumstances, especially if uh, grass exotic grass invasions are left idle and unmanaged and undisturbed, they're allowed to build up these really thick litter layers. There are these two species, Kentucky bluegrass and smooth are really good at that. 
And so that would be kind of a direct relationship to bees because it can determine which bees are there who has uh, nesting resources who can access the ground. So that can also filter out bee species. And the reason be what kind of bee species are there is because that affects the ecosystem services that come from those bees. So pollination services are the main ecosystem service that comes from bees. And so um, determining like how what kind of bee species is really important, especially for what it means to uh, bee function. And bee function is actually, uh, so bee functional diversity is what uh, determines their pollination services. So I like to use this little chart here, not chart, figure here, um, that just shows like crop yield uh, will increase with the more diverse set of bees or pollinators that you have. And so that's focusing on crop systems, but it's the same principle out in natural systems. The more types of bees you have, the more types of pollination services you have uh, to fit many different types of plants. And so there's, it's really important to keep that functional diversity present on um, grasslands. And so that's why I'm looking at how exotic grasses will impact those services. Um, so some of the ways bees lend those, uh, lend their services is through their different functional traits. So I'll be focusing on four main groupings today, body size, diet, sociality, and nesting habit. For body size, bees can range in very many different sizes, from a big bumblebee to a small little hylias bee. Um, and that determines what flowers they can visit and what flowers they provide those pollination services to. So bumblebees, for instance, can't land on a, like a little chickweed flower. That's just not feasible for them. Um, for a diet, some bees can visit many different plants and use pollen from many different types of plant species, while others, and those are generalist species, um, other species have to use a specific type of plant, uh, even down to a species. So those are specialized bees. Um, so that determines which plants they provide those pollination services to. Sociality, bees vary greatly in their social uh, groupings. Bees can be super social. Uh, it's like honeybees and bumblebees where you have a main egg layer queen and a lot of workers helping out. Um, all, but most bees are actually solitary where they collect their own pollen and provision their own nests themselves. And that can be important. And these social strategies kind of influence their foraging strategies. So that'll affect uh, how they provide their services. There's also kind of traits that fall between the diet and sociality groups, and this is called parasitism. So there are bee parasites. There are kleptoparasites, which enter another bee's nest. The uh, parasitic larvae will uh, kill the host larvae and eat all its food, so it's stealing, so hence the word klepto. Um, and then there's also other kinds of parasitic bees. So parasitic bumblebees, for instance, kind of take it a step farther. They enter uh, another bumblebee's nest, take out the queen, and then make all the workers work for them. So it's kind of a pretty cool thing. <laughs> Um, and then uh, for nesting habit, bees uh, nest in very many different ways. Most bees nest in the ground. However, some bees uh, have to dig their holes. They're you know, programmed to dig their holes. Others are programmed to use uh, existing cavities. They can't dig it themselves. They have to find those cavities. There's also cavity nesting bees, which um, I separated out because those ones uh, will nest in like pithy stems and other kind of uh, existing cavities. And I also have a hive here as another category. North Dakota is the biggest uh, honeybee producer in the U.S. And so we have lots of honeybees here. But honeybees don't, they don't really live anywhere <laughs> like the native bee species that we have. So it's in its own category there. There's other functional traits, but those ones are the four I'll be focusing on. So it is important to keep in mind that we want to maintain these, uh, this functional diversity on our landscapes. Um, but bee diversity is affected by certain things. So resource loss is a main one, uh, just general grassland reduction, uh, fragmentation of those grasslands. Also, uh, resource loss can take form in the change of resources. So we do have a lot of exotic species and that changes the availability of resources to bee species. And as we know, these are very, very common things in the Northern Great Plains. We have lots of cropland um, and we also have lots of exotic species. So. Um, and because exotic grass invasions are expected to work, expected to, but also have been found to influence the plant community, I would expect them to contribute to bee resource loss. However, this question, as far as I know, hasn't been really looked at. Um, so this is kind of a first look at 
the relationship between invasive grasses and associated plant characters and the bee community. Um, there is a related study in Canada, I think, that, that they used non-floral com components of the plant community, but I don't think they included uh, the invasive grass aspect, unfortunately. Um, there is, since it is the first look, I kind of just wanted to see a simple linear relationships between invasive grasses, also the related plant community characters on bee communities and forb communities. I also wanted to determine how those different uh, plant community characters influence and shape the um, uh, structure of bee and floral communities. Forb communities, I should say. Uh, second objective, we'll be looking at the relationships between those plant community characters and uh, different bees uh, based on their functional traits. So for methods, this data comes from a statewide survey of bees, plants, and greater plant communities across North Dakota. So this was conducted between 2017 and 2020. Um, in this project, there's a total of 477 grassland sites that we surveyed at, um, and they are managed by many different agencies down here. Uh, public and there's we had about 120 something private sites as well as a couple NGOs. Um, however, for this particular study, I filtered the data set to use the data from 67 sites. The reason for that is because I limited the data to 67 sites because I only limited it to the sites that received two different bee sampling methods. And the reason I did that is because when you insect communities are super hard to get good measures of. And so uh, when you use different methods, you kind of, they come, they, it's a better representation of the present bee community because if you, they all have their own biases and stuff. So um, the first method that we used is netting surveys. So that just involves uh, observers netting for bees basically within a plot. And our second type of method was bee bowl surveys. And those were uh, colored cups full of soapy water that were kind of placed out on a transect out in the grassland and left on the site. For us, it was 20, 24 hours. Um, and then we can pick up the samples the next day. So bees are attracted to the color and they'll fall in. So each of the 67 sites were visited two times with both bee, both bee sampling methods. And this gives us measures of relative bee abundance, species richness, and diversity at each site. For the plant side of things, we did vegetation cover surveys, um, 50 one meter square quadrats per site. And we did these surveys after you know the growth had started. So like after July 1st had started, um, we estimated the cover of three different grass species or three different grass groups. So Kentucky bluegrass, the Mount of Smooth Broom, also um, <laughs> I have a category called other grasses. And other grasses are because it's not really feasible to train um, the 30 plus technicians that we had on our team how to identify grasses. It wouldn't, I wouldn't feel very good in that being very reliable. <laughs> um, and so we group those into other grasses. You can kind of translate that as not native, mo mostly native grass species. However, it is inclusive of other exotic grass species that just aren't Kentucky blue grass and smooth bone. So um, also estimated the amount of bare ground. We measure litter depth and the cover of each forb species in the quadrat. So that gives us measures of the grass cover, amount of bare ground, litter depth, and a couple forb richness or forb diversity values. So for the first objective for in terms of analysis, we um, just use generally as linear mixed models to uh, see the associations between uh, invasive grasses and layer depth and forb richness with our um, bee abundance, bee species richness, bee shannon diversity, forb species richness, and forb shannon diversity. Um, and after we saw those linear relationships, we looked at um, what uh, which one of those uh, predictor variable variables uh, kind of significantly contributed to uh, the bee community space, and we used ordination methods for that. Now, that for object objective two, for the functional part, I did a method called fourth corner analysis, which is a way to associate different uh, environmental variables, so those grass uh, grass cover and litter depth and forb richness, to um, functional groupings, so bees based on diet group, sociality group, body size, and nesting habit. For general results, so I had uh, 20,000 bee, bee individuals from 182 species found from those 67 sites, and then found um, 249, uh, estimated the cover of 249 forb species. For the grass side of things, this is just a, gra uh, a map of relative uh, cover of Kentucky bluegrass, smooth brome, and other grasses found on our sites. So it'd be really cool to do, see this with like all 477 sites across the state. Um, you kind of like, it's tempting to look at trends and 
be like, oh, there's a lot of Kentucky bluegrass in the pot prairie pothole region, but I, I wouldn't probably try that right now with this particular um, number of sites. Um, but what you can say is, wow, there's a lot of exotic grasses in North Dakota. Um, so for the first objective, when we're just looking at linear relationships, I plotted the estimated coefficients um, and the 95% confidence intervals. If that confidence interval crosses that zero line, that means it's not significant. If it doesn't, and it's on the right side, it's positive association. If it doesn't, and it's on the left side, it's a negative association. So B abundance, we didn't find any relationship with any of the variables that we included. I don't really like using B abundance, but a reviewer made me do that, and so I included that. And so <laughs> Uh, B species richness, uh, the only thing that we found that impacted uh, or uh, was associated with B species richness and B diversity was for species richness. And that kind of follows a lot of things that we know about bees is that they like the amount of forbs there. So, but uh, when we looked at the bee community, and this is bee community defined by genera, and I know it's stupid of me to include like a, a 3D enumeration, but I like it because of the perspective and it gives you a better like look at where things actually are falling. Um, but this is an ornation and um, oopsie doopsies. Uh, these names are the names of the bee genera. And with this, you can kind of translate it as like things that are closer on the plot are more associated and things that are farther or not. Um, so what we're looking at here is these are the axis highlighted in yellow here. And these I plotted environmental vectors here. So those are highlighted in blue. Um, and in terms of the relationship between the B genera and those vectors, if it's closer to the line, that means it's more associated as if it's in the direction. If it's in the opposite direction, it's associated, but in the opposite way. So um, what we found here is that for species richness was a significant contributor to the um, community space uh, defined by B genera. And litter depth was also, uh, we also found that litter depth was also significant contributing to the space too. So really interesting that another method would, would pull that out. Um, I think something interesting to pull out is, I thought it was interesting that uh, honeybees and bumblebees were really associated with uh, grasslands of really high litter depth in Kentucky bluegrass. I have some theories on that. And I think like one of them is bumblebees might uh, benefit from some more cover. Um, and that was from previous, I have a previous experience that kind of, kind of saw that a bit. Um, flattening it on a 2D surface and using um, the bee community as their species, which are, so this, ooh, the species name here. Um, this kind of gives us more, uh, you know, more specific look into the bee community. Um, it's just not useful unless you know these names and you know, like, things about these species to look at. Um, so, like, here, there's, like, those bumblebees and honeybees. Uh, really interesting was bare ground. Um, there's lots of ground nesting, ground nesting bees here or things that dig holes. So, that's interesting. Um, op opposite direction, what were those, what were those bumblebees? Another interesting thing was like some, there's a couple uh, um, uh, a couple species that are specialists on pollen. So they were, some of them were really associated with richness. So, um, but like I said, unless you know things about those species, it's not as helpful, which is why we do the functional stuff later on. Um, for the Forbes side of things, uh, Forbes species richness and Forbes diversity were uh, positively associated with the presence of other grass species. So like I said, most of the other grass category is the native grass species. So it kind of makes sense that there would be more, there could be more Forbes uh, diversity on sites that also have more native grass presence. Um, litter depth was negatively associated with Forbes species richness. So the more litter there were, less Forbes species. Oopsies. Um, and the less, and Forbes species, Shannon diversity was negatively associated with smooth brome, which is interesting. And I swear these plots are different. They look very similar. I, you know, that freaked me out the first time I saw it. So, but it, they are different. <laughs> um, so on the Forbes community side of things, what we found was that litter depth and smooth brome were both significant and contributing to this community. So what I thought was interesting here is that, um, Sweet clover, alfalfa, and this little triangle, uh, Canada thistle, really associated with areas of high litter depth and um, smooth brown. So that was kind of interesting. Um, the functional results, for the functional results, um, fourth core analysis gives you these like nice little grids that show the association 
or, um, or the correlation between these variables. Um, so if it's blue, it's a positive association. If it's red, it's a negative. And if it's darker, it's more. If it's less dark, then it's less. Um, and so this is the diet breath category, nesting category, sociality category, and body size category. So for the first one, um, some things that were interesting was that um, oligolactic bees, which are specialist bees, uh, negatively associated with litter depth in Kentucky bluegrass, which I thought was interesting. Weirdly positive relationship, weekly positive relationship with smooth broom. I don't, I can't, I don't, I'm still trying to think why that could have happened. Um, one thing is like these kind of all, you have to think about results from other um, groupings and see whether that can explain things, um, which I'll kind of point out later. Um, Genosities, which are the polyleptic species, they um, were positively associated with forb richness, were the only ones positively associated with forb richness. And that was, I, I mean, my best explanation for that, my best guess for that is that if you eat anything, then maybe you benefit a lot from being in a place with lots of forb species. I don't know if that's correct, but that's where I was, what I was thinking. Now, the nesting category is really interesting because it's kind of nice when something just like works out the way you expect it to. <laughs> Um, and so nest, ground nesting bees were negatively associated with litter depth. So they need access to the ground. That makes sense that they, uh, in places where there's lots of litter, they can't access the ground much. Maybe there's less ground nesting bees. Um, they also were less in places with higher Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, opposite of that were cavity nesting bees. So bees that rely on like the presence of pithy stems and standing litter, uh, positively associated with litter depth. So that was kind of cool that that worked out that way. Um, what was really interesting here in the social groupings is that the primitively used social bees, which are sweat bees, somewhat sweat bee species, um, negatively associated with litter depth. But you have to think that they're kind of all related, so you have to think of multiple categories. So those ground, those sweat bees are, you know, ground nesting bees too. So I don't know. If, yeah, that probably has something to do with those results. Um, also, used social bees, which are the social ones like bumblebees and honeybees, positively associated with litter depth and Kentucky bluegrass. Um, and so, like I said before, I'm like, well, maybe those species, well, maybe bumblebees, for instance, need more cover present for some benefit. For body size, um, small bees were positively associated with the amount of bare ground. And like I said, it's all kind of related. So you have to think about um, a lot of the small bees are, you know, those lazy agossum species. So this primitive social species were ground nesting bees. And so that could make sense there. Um, medium-sized bees negatively associated with forb richness and pretty strongly so. Um, but in this category are honeybees. And we have like, we had very many honeybees in our samples because this is North Dakota. Um, and so honeybees are actually known to uh, not really go so much for places with lots of diversity. Uh, they're more so influenced by the quantity of resources. And so that could be an explanation for that. So what we found is that really only four species richness mattered in terms of the simple linear relationships, but there's more ways to analyze this. Um, what we showed when we looked at communities that litter depths were also important here. And then what we saw is like, it really depends on the species. So like invasive grasses and other plant community characters like litter depth, uh, just how they affect bees just determines on the type of bee that you're talking about. Litter depth had negative associations with four species richness. Um, and smooth run with for overall forb diversity. So in other grasses, at communities with other grasses uh, were positively associated with forb species richness and diversity. Smooth roam and litter depth were important to shaping the forb community. So I think litter depth would be, requires a lot of um, attention from these results. So, Basically, what we learned here is that, yeah, maybe floral resources are probably more important in explaining the bee community, but we don't know that for sure. Um, however, what we found was that plant community characters associated with invasive grasses and just non-floral aspects are important in shaping both bee and florb species. Kind of the star of the show, at least in my opinion, is litter depth and how they affected both the bee and florb communities and have a strong association with them. Um, and because both bees need different varying sources or varying types of litter depths, um, it's important that we maintain uh, structural heterogeneity of across grasslands. And that's come from the heterogeneous application of disturbance processes, such as those fire grazing haying would probably disturb some things. Um, but it's not unrelated to invasive grasses because if left idle, Kentucky bluegrass and smooth brome are really good at making those um, 
thick litter layers. And they're really good at making those thick litter layers like homogeneously across the landscape. So um, especially if you do have invaded, invaded grasslands, you do really require disturbances. So this project was a first look at this topic uh, for the Northern Great Plains at least. Um, and so it provides a gateway for other research to perform. So I, since I'm looking at indirect uh, relationships, um, an obvious kind of or logical way forward is to look at path analysis and uh, stroke flow equation modeling to investigate these in indirect relationships, um, which I've, I've thought about and I'm go probably going to do, but I think it just requires more thought. I'm really scared of making bad models. And um, the because I know how important floral community is, I, I need to add these floral measures into this mix because that could explain plant diversity maybe more in, in terms of how it relates to bees. Another thing is I need to make sure that my measures are um, sufficient for some, some like, variables. Um, also, I wanna just see how important are these non-floral co community characters to the floral community characters? Do we need to be even spending time thinking too much on it or is just is floral aspects more important? So um, that'll kind of be my next direction with this topic here. So this is a huge project and had a lot of people involved with it. So I'd like to thank all the agencies that have served on their land as well as all the private landowners who volunteered us to come chase things on their land. Also our field crew here, um, also lots of different lab help and other help as well as my current department for letting me come here today. So. Hey, that's all I've got. I'd be happy to answer questions. Mm -hmm.